Our keynote speaker today is the director of the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, the, one of the major institutes at the National Institutes of Health. His name is Gary Gibbons. Um, Dr. Gibbons uh, was an undergraduate at Princeton, and from there he went on to uh, Harvard Medical School. And from there he did, I believe, a residency, maybe a residency at, at the Brigham Women's Hospital, and maybe a fellowship there as well. He also managed to somehow stick in there, I believe, a faculty ship at Harvard Medical School and a faculty ship at uh, Stanford University and uh, then led the, uh, founded and led the Cardiovascular Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine prior to taking on the leadership of the NHLBI. It's very appropriate that he is our closing keynote because um, he's made precision medicine really the shining um, scientific output of the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, literally on the order of 100,000 plus individuals with whole genome sequencing and super rich phenotyping, literally thousands of phenotypes, creating a resource in top med that I think is both unparalleled and I think insufficiently celebrated or even known about. He's also been very acutely aware of issues of health disparities and discrimination. And I hope he won't uh, contradict me, but I consider him a friend. And when I knew he really was a friend, was in a collaboration that we had where we were looking at, this was early on in the genomic era, we were looking on at single nucleotide poly polymorphism, SNPs, of uh, African Americans, of uh, European origin Americans, and of Yorubans. And what was amazing at the time was that with very few SNPs, maybe 50 SNPs, you could see the speaking of being able to see it in a flash. Just 50 SNPs was enough to distinguish um, African uh, Yorubans from the um, European uh, origin Americans. And the African Americans were mostly near the Yorubans, but there was a huge tentacle going towards Europeans for mostly the unpleasant reasons that Neil Poe alluded to in his uh, discussion. And when I, in my early in my collaboration, I sort of, with, uh, uh, with Dr. Gibbons, I sort of described it that way, and he very politely, but quite firmly, put me in my place, because he let me know that Africa was not like a pinpoint, that Africa was not Yoruba, Yorubans, and that it was a very, very diverse continent, and that depending where the slave ships had uh, left Africa, and where they arrived, in uh, the United States really determined a lot about the genetic heterogeneity and cultural heterogeneity of those groups. And what was wonderful about that, in my mind, what made him a friend was that he was comfortable in being very direct about me. I didn't feel guilty about it, I just didn't know. And, but he educated me about it and it was really constructive. And so I think he's actually had that role nationally which is helping us have that conversation. And I look forward to his remarks here. Now, Gary, even though you did not come to your alma mater, I'm gonna be generous with you. I'm gonna give you the full time left until 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If there's time left before, we're going to ask, let it be for questions. If it's not, We'll just say, Gary, we love you, goodbye. So it's up to you, Gary. Looking forward to your talk. Okay, great. Uh, with that wonderful uh, introduction from my dear friend, uh, Zach, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join you. Uh, I apologize, I wasn't able uh, to 
uh, participate earlier, uh, but uh, I saw the uh, agenda and you had some terrific speakers and, and great topics. Uh, so I'll just try to, uh, from the uh, perch that I sit as the director of NHLBI, uh, share uh, what I believe is a scientific imperative of diversity and inclusive excellence uh, in precision medicine for all. Uh, and uh, I hope that that aligns with uh, uh, the objectives of this meeting uh, and, and its uh, uh, organizers. Next slide, please. Uh, toward that end, I always start with my touchstone that uh, I occupy a position, uh, a privileged position of public service. Uh, I, I work for you uh, in the public interest uh, for public good, uh, to fulfill our mission to turn discovery science uh, that uh, enhances the, the health of uh, our nation. Uh, and it's a very sacrosanct uh, and, and privileged position of service uh, because it involves two important public goods that are part of our common wealth as a nation. Uh, science and the knowledge that we gain from it uh, and our scientific workforce. And I would submit in this talk uh, that the notion of diversity, inclusion and equity is critically important both in our science and our scientists. Uh, and that aligns with what uh, I've tried to follow as uh, some enduring principles, uh, which is to value um, the investigator initiated fundamental discovery science by a diverse uh, group of scientists, a diverse community of scientists, uh, and enabling them as one of our most important uh, activities. Uh, and we, uh, it's important for us to maintain a, a balanced cross-disciplinary portfolio that spans the spectrum of basic, translational, clinical, population, uh, and community-engaged research. Another principle uh, that I hope is particularly germane to many in the audience is to train a diverse new generation of leaders in science uh, as a critical uh, enduring principle, uh, as well as support implementation science that empowers patients and enables partners to improve the health of our nation. And finally, uh, something I'm passionate about that Zach alluded to is that to innovate in evidence-based elimination of health inequities in our country and around the world. Uh, so it's with that touchstone uh, that I'd like to share some thoughts on precision medicine. Next slide, please. Toward that end, uh, I believe uh, our opportunities to build diverse resources to advance uh, precision health. Uh, and it'll fall into these three domains that I'll touch on. Again, uh, our workforce, the scientists, uh, and other uh, investigators, uh, and the resources that we have, as well as a particular emphasis on our clinical and implementation research uh, toward uh, driving precision medicine um, for all. Next slide, please. Uh, as uh, I'm sure uh, this uh, audience has already discussed uh, today, um, there is a uh, uh, I think an appreciation that uh, talent uh, is widely distributed, uh, but uh, opportunity uh, often is not. Uh, and that uh, an important goal, I think, as a uh, biomedical field community uh, is toward uh, what we're calling inclusive excellence that we believe is fundamental to driving innovation and scientific advances. Uh, although uh, some may put forward a, a moral or moral uh, persuasive argument uh, for diversity and inclusion, uh, as a group of scientists uh, who are data driven, um, indeed, uh, I would submit uh, that much research also suggests that we will have better outcomes in innovation, ideation, uh, the application of technology. Uh, if we have this uh, principle of promoting inclusive excellence, uh, where indeed um, we'll solve problems because there are a variety of diverse perspectives 
expertise and experiences around the table as we brainstorm together. Uh, and that we'll have uh, a deeper uh, thought provoking discussions and dialogue uh, and ideas um, as a result. Uh, and then that can drive uh, research that uh, is influenced by one's uh, personal lived experience as well as training and expertise, each of which is distinct and unique for each of us. That's what we bring to the table. And that's why uh, I believe uh, the most productive uh, organizations and teams are ones that uh, not everyone looks the same, sounds the same, had the same training, uh, and uh, has the same perspective and approach to a problem. Uh, and there's data to suggest uh, indeed that that is borne out. Next slide, please. This is a challenge for us uh, at NIH uh, because as shown uh, here on this slide, uh, we uh, have a way to go uh, as we move toward promoting inclusive excellence uh, and uh, uh, equity uh, in our scientific enterprise. As you all know, uh, one of the gold standards of uh, NIH research and academia is the R01. And you can see amongst the all R01s uh, on the left, uh, the sex gender breakdown. Uh, in this case, uh, as you see, 31% female relative to 68% for all R01 winners, awardees. Um, perhaps a, a glimmer of light uh, is that uh, if you look at the early stage investigators, it appears as though uh, we have cohorts that are moving closer uh, to the parity representative of our population. Uh, and uh, actually, if you go earlier upstream in our sort of training pipeline of mechanisms, the career development awards, the K awards, uh, and eventually the Fs that include pre-docs and post-docs, you can see much closer uh, relationship of parity by sex and gender. Uh, similar story, uh, perhaps more stark, uh, is for race ethnicity on the right, uh, where you look at uh, all R01 awardees, and uh, that uh, black sliver there represents all uh, underrepresented minority groups, uh, black and brown, uh, uh, and um, American Indian and other communities. Uh, and uh, again, a slight glimmer of hope as you look at the pipeline, uh, where uh, now there are Many, for example, African-American PhDs, more African-American PhDs being graduated than there are um, perhaps even jobs in the uh, academia. Uh, and so uh, there, the, the pipeline appears to be robust. Uh, unfortunately, our prof professoriate, uh, and particularly the leadership of our professoriate in our academic institutions, still looks like that R01 uh, sort of dimension on the left. And we have work to do collectively as a community. Next slide, please. Uh, toward that end, uh, for particularly if uh, there are uh, for the uh, earlier stage folks in the audience, I uh, just want to point out just a couple of a, a whole litany of, of programs we have for career development, uh, but some of you may not be aware of. One is uh, maximizing opportunities of scientific and academic independence careers. Uh, the NIH Mosaic Award, it's a trans-NIH award for the most part, run at NIGMS uh, in uh, the Mosaic, uh, which is the kd 99 r 0 with a focus on expanding diversity. Uh, and there you can see Dr. Agola as one of our exemplars. Uh, uh, I have a uh, soft spot for a young uh, African-American vascular biologist. Uh, I was one a long time ago when Zach knew me. Uh, in, in my early days. Uh, on the right uh, is, uh, again, a new program, uh, Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. FIRST is a common fund program where we actually want to partner with institutions uh, because it's in the institutions that really define the culture of academia uh, and define the environment uh, for both training and faculty development. And we recognize that inclusive excellence uh, and equity um, ultimately involves cultural change, changes in our structures, our processes, our institutions, 
uh, our relationships between uh, power and privilege. And that's a cultural uh, process that we hope um, to catalyze, uh, particularly uh, uh, in this last couple of years where uh, our nation has been wrestling with a racial reckoning. Uh, and we're um, thinking about inclusion and diversity uh, as fundamental to who we are as America and who our institutions should aspire to be uh, is still a work in progress. Uh, and we hope to uh, facilitate uh, those local uh, uh, dialogues and, and cultural changes uh, in ways that uh, can promote greater inclusion into the professoriate uh, such that it is more reflective of the diversity of the talent in our country. Next slide, please. Uh, let me then shift from the workforce um, to our, our clinical research infrastructure and enterprise. Next slide, please. Where I hope we, we can continually catalyze this notion of, of inclusion uh, as part uh, and parcel uh, interwoven into the fabric of everything we do uh, as we study uh, and explore um, science. Uh, and particularly in the realm of uh, clinical science, where it's so important that we generate knowledge uh, that can help all patients uh, in all communities. Uh, and it's particularly critical for precision medicine, uh, where, it's so, where we're in, in attempting uh, to get the right treatment in the right person at the right time um, and, uh, and appreciating uh, the personalized and individualized elements of that. Toward that end, um, uh, some progress has been made in ensuring that when we study a clinical problem, that we're looking at it uh, in a way that is inclusive, particularly when, with regard to the research participants under study. Uh, and uh, um, there have been uh, uh, statutory guidance on this, uh, literally, uh, certainly back to the 90s, uh, to promote inclusion. Uh, and uh, uh, in that regard, I think progress has been made on the left. You can see on the FDA, um, where you can see the sex gender breakdown, uh, where, again, important progress has been made. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we still have work to do when it comes to racial ethnic uh, diversity. Uh, in our clinical trials, particularly our FDA uh, trials that are often conducted uh, in the private sector. Uh, I'd like to believe that the NHLVI uh, has, and, and much of NIH, uh, has had a sustained commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, that relates to uh, our research participants. And you can see uh, our enrollment outcomes uh, on the right, uh, both by sex gender, uh, as well as minority uh, status. So uh, we, we are committed to this. It can be done, it can be achieved uh, with that commitment uh, and intentional efforts to ensure that it happens such that the knowledge we generate from these clinical research is broadly generalizable. Again, this is just doing good science. It's not about moral persuasion. It's about doing the right thing uh, because uh, that's the scientifically sound thing to do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, toward that end, that relates to some of our approaches and processes of conducting science, um, some of which, quite frankly, as a social enterprise of scientists, we often don't give sort of explicit uh, um, recognition of. Uh, but uh, on the left, I'll just show you is a, uh, um, some of the patterns of disease. Um, and this one relates actually to uh, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, um, uh, complications of, that get you up in an intensive care unit. And you can see uh, geographic patterns there. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise you to uh, step back. I've seen a lot of these maps. and. In, in, in looking at geographic disparities, and you could pretty much overlay um, 
cardiovascular disease mortality on this map, uh, lung disease on this map, uh, obesity on this map, diabetes on this map, um, maternal morbidity mortality on this map. Um, uh, there's a challenge in that Ohio River Valley, Mississippi River Valley in the Southeast. Uh, where there's a concentration of social conditions and, quite frankly, racial ethnic uh, strife uh, that um, has put on a disproportionate burden of disease. Um, and yet, uh, what I show you on the right is uh, a typical NIH-funded, multi-million dollar uh, clinical research network. Uh, and those that's where the clinical... Uh, coordinating center and the major clinical sites are distributed. This is a pulmonary critical care network, and it's one of my favorites, so I'm not picking on those PIs, uh, but you, you might notice a certain clustering uh, in the Northeast, um, not necessarily where all uh, the greatest burden of disease is, uh, and yet uh, that, that Mississippi Valley uh, in the Southeast, uh, relative paucity of um, the network, and yet this is a network that needs to be able to respond, for example, to uh, COVID right now, uh, and where the ICUs are almost full to overflowing, uh, and where the cases are. Uh, and so it's something for us as a community to step back and say, well, how do we create these networks? Are there structural, systematic, maybe even unconscious um, drivers uh, that would lead to a group of people writing a grant together. Maybe it's just because we all trained at the Brigham together um, or went to medical school together uh, or hang out in scientific meetings together. Uh, and that's who I call when I want to write a, a multi-site grant. Uh, and this club, this uh, so my call the cabal, uh, gets together and and, and we drive what's going to be the research in this network. Uh, and maybe uh, if we're not diverse uh, in a variety of dimensions, uh, we might end up with maps like this and um, gaps in our ability to address these differences that may exist, different populations, different areas uh, that we could actually learn from and or produce generalizable knowledge applicable to um, those other uh, areas outside of the Northeast. Uh, so this is what will come about when we think about systemic institutional barriers to inclusion and, and our processes uh, for creating uh, scientific resources. Next slide, please. Another element uh, that's timely and related to COVID uh, is appreciating um, what I'm sure this audience is already familiar with is the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 on a variety of different communities. Again, uh, African-American, Latino, American Indian, uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, uh, et cetera. Uh, and ensuring that uh, those who are often exposed the most to the virus because of the nature of their work, often involving interfacing with the public, whether it's in the hospitality industry, uh, the grocery stores, uh, uh, et cetera, um, often had that disproportionate burden. And those are also the communities that weren't able to get testing and often have challenges getting access to quality health care. Uh, so these are the, the drivers of the health disparities that long preceded COVID, but uh, it's certainly amplified and laid bare. Uh, and so in addressing um, this public health crisis, uh, we recognize those are going to be critically important uh, that NIH uh, take an approach of inclusive participation in the NIH's biomedical response to this unprecedented public health emergency. Uh, and toward that end, we knew we would have some challenges in, in making it on the other side of this pandemic without a, a intentional uh, outreach engagement uh, of these communities and recognize the particular circumstances within these communities, particularly related to histories of, of mistrust. Uh, as shown on the right there, 
um, uh, just a, a pew poll that uh, underscores um, that the legacies of racism uh, in this country have engendered, uh, quite frankly, a legitimate skepticism uh, and mistrust um, related to prior mistreatment. Uh, so this is not a matter of uh, just grievance, um, but uh, again, a reflection of historical fact that we must uh, uh, address uh, head on. Uh, and as those seeking precision medicine, uh, I think we want to uh, appreciate uh, that uh, uh, it's critically important that as uh, members of the, the medical profession, uh, that uh, to a certain extent we owe uh, these communities uh, evidence of our trustworthiness to address this mistrust. Next slide. Toward that end, uh, as part of the NIH response um, to the COVID-19 pandemic, Francis Collins uh, approached uh, me and Dr. Elise Prestable from NIH, uh, NIHD, Minority Health Health Disparities Institute, uh, to launch uh, the SEAL program, the NIH Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. And in brief, uh, we rolled out uh, this program um, that is now in uh, about 21 uh, location states around the country where we really start to target and focus uh, specifically on communities of color, underserved communities uh, that were disproportionately burdened by COVID-19 in different phases of the pandemic. Uh, and you can see the map there, uh, and really leveraging um, NIH-funded community-engaged researchers who've had actually long-standing engagement and partnerships within these communities as part of their research efforts, and it developed uh, through these partnerships coalitions uh, of, of, again, a variety of perspectives, both the academic, community-based organization, um, healthcare uh, systems and centers, federally qualified health centers in particular, faith-based organizations, uh, state and local health departments, really bringing together the elements that we thought would be critical to addressing the various elements of this pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, toward this end, uh, and driven by uh, these uh, principles, um, this, these SEAL teams uh, establish partnerships with communities. Um, they address uh, misinformation and mistrust, uh, primarily uh, by uh, working with already extant trusted messengers, uh, and then working with NIH to develop uh, locally resonating, trusting, trustworthy messages delivered by these trusted messengers uh, as a means to increase trust in science. And I don't need to tell this audience, uh, there's an incredible amount of misinformation and uh, um, challenges with mistrust in science in our country, uh, with the hope that it would indeed accelerate the uptake uh, of beneficial interventions that we thought uh, would be of most help to the communities. And indeed, the, the, the communities, as we engage them, recognized that the best way to protect their communities, their neighbors, uh, was to engage in this research. Uh, and this enabled us uh, to establish a platform that we hope is a repeatable resource within communities to advance health equity. Uh, and, and perhaps as a model, as an approach to harness community expertise, to target research to local uh, community needs, uh, to, to provide consultative resources to support inclusive participation, whether it's in clinical trials or obser observational studies, uh, or uh, as partners in delivering um, uh, uh, healthcare, uh, and to incorporate community-engaged research platforms uh, in all NIH uh, intervention um, uh, trials and studies. And finally, uh, to, to foster and translate uh, the implementation of those findings as a return of results back to the community for community benefit as a reciprocity of that engagement and participation, a critical part. At the end of the day, this must move at the speed of trust and promote the, the, the benefit of the community at, at the center of what we're doing. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, uh, for the next slide, please, 
like to move more into uh, the application uh, in precision medicine of these concepts of inclusive participation, and inclusive excellence. And want to uh, give this uh, homage shout out to my good friend, Zach, um, for the paper his team um, put in the New England Journal several years ago that uh, I thought was a, a wonderful exemplar uh, of the challenges uh, we face in precision medicine uh, when our genomic resources don't reflect the diversity, diversity of our country or our patient population. Uh, and the, the challenges that come from uh, looking at rare uh, variation and not appreciating the full uh, genomic variation in the human family and recognizing that um, by the paucity of people of African ancestry in our genomic studies and our genomic resources, uh, we're actually uh, setting ourselves up for misdiagnoses in precision medicine. Uh, and so uh, I think I applaud Zach that this, uh, I think, was an early uh, uh, wake-up call and call to action uh, to, to address what, what's clearly a problem. Again, <laughs> uh, it, it, this isn't about political correctness or moral persuasion. Uh, this is about doing science in a robust and effective way. Uh, and applying it as clinicians uh, effectively uh, and by using and understanding the scientific data that uh, shows that the greatest genomic variation is in uh, people of African ancestry. Next slide, please. Uh, this has been a challenge uh, across the field, uh, as shown on the left. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the explosion of um, uh, genomic uh, resources. Um, uh, that have happened, particularly with the advent of, of sequencing technology beyond those SNPs that Zach talked about. Uh, and uh, you can see that huge increase in the red, uh, reflective of those of European populations, blue, East Asian. Uh, um, but it's even hard to, to, to see that little uh, speck of, of green that represents African ancestry. Uh, and, uh, and then as we apply, uh, the, the fruits of those genomic resources, such as the construction of polygenic risk scores, uh, you, you're familiar with um, the, the tail off and predictive value, not shockingly, um, that occurs as you move into other ancestral populations. So a stark lack of, of racial ethnic diversity uh, is hampering uh, our advances in precision medicine. Next slide, please. Uh, toward that end, um, as we contemplated what we could do at the NHLBI, uh, we recognized that uh, uh, we could build on a legacy of excellence in our cohort studies that goes all the way back uh, to the Framingham Heart Study begun in 1948. Uh, now, uh, again, this uh, uh, is being broadcast, I suppose, in, in Boston, so all of you are familiar with, with Framingham, particularly in 1948. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of brothers in, in Framingham, Zach. Uh, but uh, uh, to their credit, um, the Framingham Heart Study started the study of coronary heart disease with 50% women uh, and men. Uh, and so even though it wasn't appreciated how important uh, the study of heart disease in women was going to be, that it's the number one killer in women just like it is in men, uh, but has a different sort of time course in expression, that all came from the Framingham Heart Study because it was inclusive of both sex genders. Uh, and uh, the Institute has built on that uh, over the years, uh, hosting the Women's Health Initiative uh, and a variety of cohort studies, uh, one shown there, Strong Heart Study for American Indians involving 12 tribal nations, Jackson Heart Study, uh, largest African-American cardiovascular epidemiology study uh, in, of its kind, the study of Latino soul, um, and many others, uh, and including our most recent one, uh, rural, um, that is uh, obviously multi-racial ethnic, uh, but focused in on those geographic disparities that we described in the Ohio River, Mississippi River Valley in the Southeast. Next slide, please. Um, as Zach alluded to, this was also uh, our motivation to leverage this legacy to build uh, top med as a um, uh, genomic, phenomic uh, resource. Uh, now with over 150,000 
whole genomes um, that's reflective and drawn upon those various cohorts uh, and other studies um, to then uh, have on the pie chart on your left uh, a representation that uh, com com comes a bit closer uh, to reflecting America uh, and uh, with a variety of different phenotypes as well. And again, uh, more than 50% women uh, with a variety of, of uh, data types, um, not only whole genome sequencing, but uh, transomic, RNA-seq, uh, metabolome, proteome, uh, et cetera. Uh, and toward that end, uh, it was really important for us uh, to, pu to put this in a cloud-based resource that would more make, be more broadly accessible uh, and sort of transition from the sort of download uh, um, modalities of, of data sharing to one where you go to the data and therefore in a cloud-based environment, uh, it could be literally uh, accessible throughout the world. And no longer did you need a uh, high performance uh, uh, computer cluster uh, in, in the next building uh, to run your analyses that uh, indeed uh, you could go to this NIH resource to do that if that wasn't at your institution. And so the, the limitations uh, the equity uh, of being able to access this resource uh, that is also reflective of the diversity of the human family, uh, we thought was an important uh, democratized resource to make available. Next slide, please. Uh, it also has multiple dimensions uh, in, in, uh, of, of imaging, uh, social determinants, environmental influence. So it's really beyond just genomics, uh, but uh, indeed is a rich and deep phenotyping data source. Uh, but one of its utilities leverages all those genomes from a variety of uh, ancestral groups uh, to create the TopMed imputation server, which uh, has utility uh, in being able to uh, um, uh, accelerate and enable uh, better genomic research. Um, again, not about political correctness of how many samples are from this ancestral group, but because of this, uh, the ability to impute is enhanced scientifically, technically, um, because uh, of our uh, inclusivity uh, of our science. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, toward that end, uh, this is just one example. There are many, many, many now. Uh, but uh, I thought this was uh, notable because it actually leveraged the strong heart study of American Indians. Uh, and it looked at uh, DNA methylation patterns, the epigenome in a sort of genome wide uh, way, epigenome wide way, uh, to look at uh, uh, predictors of coronary heart disease. Uh, and one of the, the notable factors about the strong heart study is it obviously uh, confirmed um, the Framingham uh, risk factors for heart disease, even though uh, 40, 30 years ago when it started, it wasn't even clear. Uh, some people thought American Indians didn't even develop uh, heart disease. Uh, again, another myth uh, related to lack of inclusion. Uh, but what was discovered as well is that uh, the strong heart study uh, of these 12 tribal nations, primarily located in Oklahoma, South Dakota, North Dakota, Arizona, well, often on reservations uh, where uh, their access to water is limited. Indeed, unfortunately, as part of this nation's history, uh, often they were moved off of land with the best water uh, as part of their uh, subjugation and oppression. Uh, and um, so many uh, have only a source of well water. And as part of the strong heart studies, um, very high levels of cadmium and arsenic has been um, detected in the biospecimens and indeed uh, has been identified as one of the accelerators and risk factors for this particular uh, population. And as many of you might imagine, um, there's actually been some studies to suggest that that has an influence on the epigenome of those American Indians, that exposure to those metals uh, actually has its own signature. Uh, and indeed, that signature uh, can be linked back uh, to uh, incident um, coronary heart disease and identify regulatory networks that uh, may be of interest. Uh, and so uh, by having this diverse 
uh, panoply of different populations and different contexts, I believe uh, we'll have uh, a greater understanding of all the molecular pathways and exposure pathways uh, that promote heart disease. Next slide, please. Um, uh, yeah. uh, and finally, to conclude, uh, one example uh, that uh, relates to asthma uh, as one of our uh, health disparity conditions uh, that involves uh, the, the interplay between genes and environment uh, and a variety of risk factors uh, for which there's abundant data uh, of striking health disparities, particularly among uh, Hispanic and African-American children, uh, where this is a major uh, problem, the leading uh, cause of uh, disability amongst children. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, toward this end, um, many of you are familiar uh, with the notion that uh, where you live and grow and play and worship uh, has an important determinant on your health. Your zip code may be as important as your genetic code in addressing um, what health outcomes and predicting what health outcomes may be, particularly if we're talking about precision medicine. Place matters. Uh, and as shown on the left, um, the places, the communities that black and brown children live in uh, often have the, the greatest burden of air pollution. Look at uh, particulate matter measures uh, and others. Um, it's clear that although air is evenly distributed uh, everywhere, uh, air pollution tends to concentrate uh, in the most vulnerable communities. It's not an accident where we locate um, our densest highway crossings or our where we put power plants uh, or, uh, um, uh, or waste disposal. Uh, and so uh, exposures, again, are not uniformly uh, distributed. Uh, and this has consequences. Uh, on the right, uh, you can see a distribution there uh, in Southern California um, that relates uh, air pollution uh, to uh, lung health and be lung uh, um, development in these children, the capacity of the lungs. Uh, and uh, it's notable uh, that though the, the, the uh, communities in Southern California with the, the highest amount of particulate exposure uh, had the fewest uh, number of whites, whereas those with the lowest uh, particulate matter exposure obviously uh, was, was more in the predominantly white communities. Uh, and so this is where place matters, uh, and economic and, and racial uh, justice intersects uh, with health equity. Next slide. Um, what what I, I guess I take encouragement from is that as we move towards health equity and try to address some of these disparities, particularly in the, this case of a, an environmental exposure that is mutable, that we, if we have the intention, can change uh, to help our children have healthier lives, um, that uh, progress can be made. And indeed, in California over the years, as these various cohorts have been studied of children, uh, actually with interventions, air pollution has come down somewhat. Uh, and with that, uh, the number of kids who have abnormal or stunted lung development and lung health has reduced uh, substantially. And I take this away as uh, recognizing that this may be an opportunity, particularly in this context of climate change, uh, where uh, if we are intentional uh, about creating a healthy environments where all our children can thrive, uh, that indeed um, uh, there are ways to, to intervene and make a difference. Uh, this may not be precision medicine, but it's uh, precision prevention uh, in a way that uh, in, in it, 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 suggests that the social determinants of health may be another leveraging point as much as a, a drug or a molecule. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll close with this uh, example uh, in which um, um, that lung function uh, actually has a long history. Uh, and particularly, uh, I suspect has been discussed today with regard to references. Um, we have a reference genome, uh, which quite frankly is historically Eurocentric, 
Uh, and we have a number of measures uh, that uh, have used uh, 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 Europeans, whites, as the reference. Uh, and this is true for pulmonary function as well. Uh, and uh, these things have history. Uh, you'll see on the right uh, an interesting study over time about the, uh, these are published uh, articles and uh, looking at what was attributed historically interpreting the data, the data is the data, but in the interpretation of the data, the etiology of racial differences and how they were described and how so often, particularly in the early days, um, these differences in which whites were at the top of the hierarchy and blacks and brown people were at the lower part of the hierarchy, the presumption was that the whites were at the top because of inherent um, um, superiority. Uh, and that's true of a lot of reference panels. Uh, in fact, some of the data that forms that basis, particularly in the 1920s, uh, was actually reflective of data collected during the Civil War, where they took soldiers, uh, black and white, and tried to measure their lung function. We can imagine the Civil War when you're comparing a white soldier and a black soldier, uh, and the black soldier was an ex-slave, you can imagine the lived experience of that ex-slave for generations related to an inferior diet, inferior living conditions, uh, and a, a variety of other stressors uh, uh, that uh, uh, may influence development, um, that there would be some differences but it was presumed that whatever differences existed must be inherent in that race. And therefore uh, they have inferior lung function. That was the presumption. I would hope that uh, we might be a little bit more enlightened in 2021 with our precision medicine, but actually these, still, these algorithms and nomograms still exist, even though we still haven't fully understood what is the etiologic basis of these, this variance. That's what we do as scientists. How much of it is genetic? How much of it is influenced by social determinants? I just showed you a series of studies that would suggest that where you live can influence your lung development, your lung function, and therefore your predisposition to asthma. And yet that has to be considered as well. Next slide, please. Toward this end, uh, uh, this is with uh, full disclosure, uh, a certain amount of, 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 of uh, um, uh, personal uh, uh, note that uh, this is the work of uh, Esteban Burchard, uh, who's a Latino uh, pulmonologist, uh, uh, genetic epidemiologist, who I've known uh, since my days on faculty at Stanford. And so I've followed Esteban's work over the years uh, again, a former uh, Brigham trainee. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's notable that he had developed this paper coming out of top bit uh, in which uh, he identified, as you many of you can already see uh, from this Manhattan plot, uh, an, an, an African ancestry uh, uh, associated region associated with decreased volume of exhaled hair, air. Uh, and this locus, uh, appears to may involve a mediator uh, with uh, inflammatory uh, 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 pathways. Uh, and so uh, we, we don't know if this is uh, a great biomarker yet or whether that's a druggable target, uh, but uh, he's contributing uh, to understanding really the scientific basis of some of these differences uh, and an appreciation that there's an environment and gene interaction that uh, is at play. Next slide, please. Uh, I would dare say that would not, that study wouldn't be possible uh, without a top med to give us insight into those uh, hierarchies, if you will. Uh, and then finally, uh, we hope to translate that into precision medicine for asthma. Indeed, we have a program, Precise, that is attempting to really start to uh, apply these new technologies, whether it's genotypes or biomarkers, uh, to, to align getting the right drug and the right person at the right time um, that appreciates these contextual issues as well as the individual predispositions uh, in ways that we hope 
will address health disparities. Next slide, please. So what I've tried to share with you uh, in the time we've had uh, is uh, our perspective uh, at the NHLBI uh, in working with you as part of our circle of partners uh, to advance uh, a scientific agenda, indeed a scientific imperative to promote diversity and inclusive excellence uh, for precision medicine for all. Thank you for very much for your attention. Gary, that was truly uh, wonderful. And frankly, I would say the most optimistic part of our day today, because you, you've really, I think, shown us a path forward. I hope the slide that you showed us about the Fs and the Ks having an increased fraction does actually foreshadow a improved pipeline. I do think the studies that you showed uh, from TopMed are wonderful, and I have to just say parenthetically, it may have been just a, the placebo effect, but when I saw no contrails in the sky over us when uh, COVID shut down air travel, I did feel like I was breathing more easily, and I wonder if there's studies now being done by NHLBI to see if we've had decreased uh, lung disease, at least in the short term. But you really, you've really addressed many of the issues that were brought up today and you've really translated that into, without no, unwittingly or because of convergent evolution, into a scientific agenda. I think that addresses many of the issues we brought up. So thank you for sharing your vision with us. I apologize to both, the, both you, the people in attendance, and the online uh, group that our, our time for this conference has now come to an end. So thank you very much, for everybody, for your participation. And I look forward, hopefully, to a more in-person session next year.